We are dealing with a sensitive series. We began on Sunday, Fundamentals of Spiritual Warfare. And I feel stirred in my spirit to continue with this teaching tonight. I believe many persons with great destinies, great potentials, are not fulfilling it, not because they are not hardworking, not because they are not visionary, but largely because they are fighting battles beyond their understanding and beyond their fortification. I can tell you that Africans are hardworking. I can tell you that Africans are blessed. But we need certain levels of fortification in the place of understanding in engaging spirits so that we can have the way forward as touching our destinies. Our contemporaries in the Western world to a very large extent had access to the light of the gospel before we ever did. And whether you believe it or not, it has given them an advantage. Jesus, the Son of God, help the sister, did not come from Africa. When he came in the likeness of man, he did not come from our borders. The tribe that God chose as his people, he didn't begin from this region. It was God's plan that it would extend to us, which eventually did. But I can tell you that those who encountered God first had an advantage. In fact, Paul was preaching in the book of Romans, and he said that we were engrafted because they rebelled. So we have to understand that we need to learn fast and to catch up. That we didn't receive it first does not necessarily mean we will not fulfill our destinies. It also has its own benefit because we are the last people that God will use for the final emancipation. And this is why the last day revival is beginning from Africa. It's like handing over buttons. And you know that usually the best is saved for the last. So although it looks like we are disadvantaged, but what God wants to do with us will be greater than anything the world has ever known. He said, before them is a desolate, before them is the garden of the Lord, behind them is a desolate wilderness. That means what God has done in the past compared to what God will do in the future, the past is a joke. So we have an advantage, but we have to be quick to learn, to catch up, so that we can bridge the gap of ignorance that has, in a way, affected our manifestation. So Africans are disciplined. Africans are very intelligent. But we must also catch up in light, understanding the ways of God, submitting to the ways of God. You know, if you go to certain nations today, the way the cultures we receive from our parents, and now there are a few of them that are good, the moral ones. But you see, some of the ones that made us give allegiance to demons, diabolic practices, they are not necessarily good, all right? But if you go to some nations of the world today, their culture is Christian in nature. As a normal, I'm not talking somebody is preaching, their value system. Because they've encountered the ways of God for over 200, 300, 500 years. So certain battles have been won. The children are working in the inheritance. But those of us sitting in this small auditorium here, I can assure you that some of you, you are the first Christians in your generation. That means there is a lot of darkness to deal with. And if you don't fight, nobody will fight for you. If you don't fight, you will allow warfare for your children. This is why now that we have received the gospel, we must wake up to maximize it. You know, I began telling you last week that we are all in, in the middle of a very thick warfare. And the unfortunate thing is that we didn't choose the battle. The battle chose us. So it's not an issue of, I, I, I'm not interested, I don't want to fight. It's not about choice. You were chosen. The battle has already chosen you. You have to wake up and fight. Look at some scriptures quickly, just to corroborate the things I'm trying to say. First Peter 5 verse 8. It said, be sober, be vigilant, 
Because your adversary, the devil. When did I make him an enemy? I don't know when I had quarrel with this being. But the first counsel is what? Be sober. That means be at alert. If you relax, you'll be in trouble. Be vigilant. Watch. Because you have an enemy that chose you. You didn't choose him. Your adversary, the devil. He said, as a roaring lion. So this your adversary is not a sheep. He fights like a lion. He fights like a hungry tiger. So you must understand that ferocity and aggression is a necessary part of the battle that you have been summoned into. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is not seeking whom to just fight with. He's seeking whom he will devour. Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10, the Bible said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It said, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand the wise of the devil. Verse, verse 12, it said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. When did I enter a wrestling match? The ring was designed before you were born. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities. Now, this is not just an enemy that functions disoriented way, in a disoriented manner. It's a well-structured, organized system of offense against you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against wickedness, in the heavenly places. So you are in the middle of an intense battle. And your enemy is an organized system that will devour and destroy you if you are not fortified with the necessary intelligence. And so Paul speaking, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11, he said, lest Satan has an advantage over us. He said, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This scripture is for those who are born again. So if you make the mistake to assume that because you are in Christ, you have no battles, you are joking. The only advantage is that you are fighting from victory because you are more than a conqueror. But if you don't understand your advantage and maximize it, you will become a victim. He said, if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because your God is not powerful. He said, it's because your strength is little. So if you want to have victory, sustain your victory, you must have necessary equipping in order to have an advantage. And last week, we looked at three basic things. Number one, we tried to define the nature of our enemy. And we dealt with three major dimensions of enemies. And I'll deal with them because today I want to deal with the dynamics. It's a bit more intricate tonight. We looked at men that cooperate with Satan. They are wicked and unreasonable men in this world that want you destroyed. And as I deal with the dynamics of warfare, I will show you how these people fight so that you can be fortified. There are wicked men that will have no joy except as you are destroyed. In fact, your destruction is what gives them solace. They will literally give thanks that you went down. It is the nature of men. They, a lot of people cooperate with the devil to advance his ad agenda. And I told you that if without men, spirits will not be powerful on earth. Only God can function in this realm without the cooperation of men. And even God does not operate like that. Because there are two dimensions to God. There is the sovereign dimension of God. Where he can do whatever he please, pleases and is right because he's sovereign. And there's also another dimension of God where in his love, he reduces himself to relate with his children according to laws. So that those laws will give them a, a gateway into his realm for participation. Alright? Apart from that, no other spirit can function on earth without men. So when you see devils walking on earth, know that they have the cooperation of men. So the first enemy we identified are wicked and unreasonable men. The second enemy we identified are demons. And we said demons are messengers. Because even in the demonic ranking, in the rankings of, of Satan... There are messengers they send. Just the way it is in the realm of God. Where you have angels. But angels are not the only spirits in the realm of God. There are princes in the realm of God who don't run errands. For example, the 20 and 4 elders don't run errands for God. 
They co rule with him in eternity. That's why they have thrones. And if you study Revelation chapter 5, when John was confused as to what to do in heaven and he was weeping, the Bible says one of the elders came unto him and said, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. So they understand matters of government. And God gives them the privilege of participation. Those are not messengers. They are princes in the realm of God. In the demonic realm, there are messengers and there are princes. Demons are messengers. And demons can only function when they possess men. Because they don't have jurisdiction to function in this realm. So when you find demons at work, you can cast them out. If you have and understand your authority in Christ. Because they don't have legal jurisdiction to function on earth. But we said demons are not the only enemies in the demonic ranking. There are princes who have bodies. Who can rule territories. You don't cast those ones out. You wrestle with them. So when you are dealing with men, you need wisdom. You need the leading of the Holy Spirit. You need value systems. You need laws and principles to prevail. When you are dealing with demons, you need to understand who you are in Christ. Exercising your authority in order to have victory. When you are dealing with principalities, build stamina. <laughs> because they don't cast them out. They fight them. After Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the anointing would have been boiling. Some a being showed up and said, if you are the son of God, because they, these ones don't possess men. They are princes. They are looking for territories to dominate. So if you don't understand that even in the demonic, there are beings that you will fight to stand your ground, you will become a victim before you start. So we said the first thing is to understand the nature of your adversity. And we took time to outline that last week. And then we went further to outline the weapons that they use or how they fight. And we showed a few of them. Number one, in fact, we dealt with the dimensions of battle that we face when we are dealing with any of these entities. And number one, we said there is the battle of attrition. And we said the battle of attrition encompasses every kind of battle. The only nature of this battle is that the devil comes to weary you out. So he can come with any dimension of the battle. But the goal is for you to get tired and to give up. And we took time to outline and itemize scriptures. That's where I quoted Proverbs 24 verse 10. If you faint in the day of trouble. So they come to fight you to faint. He said if you faint, it's because your strength is small. Matthew 12, 43 to 44. When an evil spirit is gone out of a man, the Bible said he moves in dry places. If he doesn't find where to stay, it will return to that man. And it will return with seven more wicked demons. Even Jesus, when he was tempted... The Bible said, and Satan liveth him for a season. So in the battle of attrition, whatever the devil is using against you, he will keep coming until you give up. So we said that dimension of battle requires a lot of spiritual stamina because you have to prevail. That's why I said, having done all to stand. Ephesians 6.13, it says, stand therefore. So victory in this battle is the capacity to stand. It's a dimension of warfare. And then we spoke about misrepresentation as another dimension of this battle. They try to misrepresent everything you are doing so that you are frustrated. Revelations 12 verse 10 and 11 and 12, the Bible made us to understand that Satan was called the accuser of the brethren. So the goal is to misrepresent you. And I told you that the way to fight this particular kind of battle is by the blood and by the words of your testimony. And I showed you how to administer the blood. You don't administer the blood by saying, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead. That is not biblical. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. Two basic ways of administering the blood is number one, by the communion table. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, after he outlined the whole procedure for administering the communion, he said, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death. So we release the power of the finished works of Christ on the communion table. And I said the second way to administer the blood is by walking in the light of the word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 verse 7, it said if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it said the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. So the blood of Jesus is activated when you begin to walk in the light. This is why as a Christian, you cannot afford to function by endless human genealogies. 
you have to live according to the revelation of the scripture. And if I may add, the third way to administer the blood is by proclaiming the word of God. That's why I said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the words of their testimony. So if you want to see the power of the blood, you must learn to understand and prophesy scripture. If you don't prophesy scripture, the blood will be impotent as far as your battles are concerned. Misrepresentation. Number four. Number three dimension of battle, I said, is torment. Satan comes to torment people. And most times, he uses their weaknesses, like fear. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, he says, As much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, himself likewise took part of the same, that he might deliver them, that he might deliver them from the power of death, the devil who has the power of death. And he said, They who all their lifetime were kept in bondage through fear. And the Bible told us in 2 Timothy 2.7 that fear torments. So when the devil wants to fight you sometimes, he just creates a system of frustration around you so you are tormented. But I told you one of the ways of winning that battle is to stay stirred up. Stay stirred up. That's why in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6, before Paul spoke about verse 7, where he talked about fear, he told Timothy, this charge... Give I thee, son Timothy, that you stir up the gift of God that is in you. So that fear does not cripple you. Rather, that you walk in the gift of the spirit. Because he said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he has given us the spirit of what? Of boldness, of love, and of a sound mind. So if you are not stirred up, fear will subdue you. And it's one of the strategies Satan uses in warfare to cripple God's children. This is why you must not be drunk with wine wherein is excess. But you must be filled with the spirit. Because you don't know where the devil wants to take you on unawares. You are driving and suddenly you hear a sound in your, in your engine. Your heart jumps and you, you, you drive into a ditch. Because fear was locking. But if you stay stirred up when there is something. Before you know what is happening. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. You just arrest the whole atmosphere. Because your spirit controls your environment. I wish you understood that. Your spirit controls your environment. If your spirit is weak, anything can permeate your atmosphere. But when you are strong because you are stirred, nothing can penetrate your atmosphere. You will shut the gate and there's nothing Satan can do about it. Number four, we spoke about direct attacks or confrontation. Luke 13, 16. Ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan, these 18 years, lo, has bound. So Satan attacks people directly. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. They were oppressed of the devil. So there is a place where Satan attacks men. You know, as I, as I proceed tonight, I will show you, there are many things that are difficult to capture doctrinally. But don't argue their manifestation. No. Somebody tells you that for the past one year, she's been molested by spirits and she can feel it. Don't come and say, it's not in the Bible. You are joking. No. I will show you today many things that theologians have not been able to explain from the Bible. I will show you. There are many of them here. Because the manifestation is superior to what we can explain doctrinally. In fact, the things we are able to explain doctrinally are there for certain reasons. And one of it is so that we can believe in Jesus. Doctrine is designed in such a way that you know enough to believe in Jesus. In John 21, from verse 15, if you read down towards the end, 20, it said, many things did Jesus, captured within manifestation, that are not written. It said, but these ones are written that you may know that is the son of God and that you might believe on his name, that believing you might have eternal life. The things captured in doctrine are designed and enough to give you a victorious life. Second Peter 1 verse 3, according as his divine power, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has what? Brought us to glory and virtue. So doctrine is not the complete ambience of manifestation. There are manifestations you can't explain. But the one that doctrine affords us is enough for us to know Jesus. It's enough for us to live a victorious life. And God designed it that way 
to also give us an advantage. He said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things that are, the secret things belong to God. Doctrine does not explain all the secret things. The secret things belong to God. He said, but the things that are revealed, he said, those ones belong to us and to our children forever. Now, as a Christian, what do we advise? Stay within the ambience of doctrine. But don't make the mistake of assuming that everything we can explain in doctrine is everything there is. So when you are fighting battles, you will see many manifestations that doctrine can capture. Go and read your Bible. Let me give you a few of them since I'm talking about them now. I'll show you things that theologians have debated for aeons that they cannot have an absolute position. Number one, the witch of Endor being able to summon prophet Samuel and Samuel came to give a prophetic word about the death of Saul that happened the next day. <laughs> Went into the gates of the underworld and brought a prophet, a holy man of God. And the holy man showed up and told Saul what will happen the next day. And it happened. These are things that have been debated. That's not all. The origin of demons. Where do they come from? You can't explain it, but you can't deny their manifestation. There are arguments that say demons are disembodied beings because they are the sons of the Nephilims. And that when the first world was destroyed, they were purged. And because they were offsprings of spirits, and because God did not have a provision for them, there was nowhere they could go. So when their bodies were destroyed, they began to look for bodies to possess. Because they were created, they were born with bodies. That's when angels in, had intimacy with, with daughters of men. They gave birth to giants. When God purged the world in the days of Noah, those giants were destroyed. But their spirits had nowhere to go. Because God didn't have them in his plan. So they started floating about as demons. And they are the ones who possess men. That's one argument. And there are many other arguments. And theologians keep debating and debating. Because the manifestation is real, but there's no accurate explanation of doctrine. That's why when you are in warfare, you need a lot of wisdom. In practice, stay within doctrine. But in manifestation, know that there are many scopes. There are many syllables. This is why the Holy Ghost comes to help us. Because the much we know from Bible is good for our daily living. But when the warfare gets deep in the spirit, you need prophetic direction. You need the Holy Ghost to guide you. You need the wisdom of God to guide you. However, all your practices should remain within doctrine. If it goes beyond doctrine, trust God for his sovereignty to intervene. But I'm telling you that there are manifestations that are difficult to be explained by doctrine. Take for example, the ascension of Enoch and Elijah to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. How did they go to heaven? And there was no testimony of transfiguration. They were carried like that bodily to heaven. And the Bible said, Elijah will come again. From where? Where was he taken to? Are you following what I'm saying? I'm trying to explain this so that when you are in, in battle, don't limit yourself and say, hmm, I know a lot of people who say, this thing cannot happen. It's not in doctrine. This thing cannot happen. I don't preach extra biblical practices. I don't do that. But I can tell you that there are manifestations that you cannot explain with doctrine. That people are going through that you can't deny. How about Paul being taken to the third heaven? Even Paul said, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body. How about the sons of God and the daughters of men? Some claim that the sons of God and the daughters of men are the children born by the intimacy between angels and humans. Others say they are the children born from the intimacy between the sons of Seth and the other descendants of men that were in sin, that deliberation has been there for aeon. No absolute position. How about the man of lawlessness that boss Paul spoke about at the end of time? Is he a spirit or a man? <laughs> so there are many manifestations, right? Many manifestations. But we must understand how to fight within the context of what is revealed. Glory to God. But while we are yet fighting, 
we shouldn't deny the possibility of what is not revealed. There are people that demons, spirits, come to molest and they will show you all the signs. Some of them are even captured on camera. You see, you don't see anybody, but you see physical things happening and you are wondering, how is this possible? It's not something you want to come into church and start trying to explain with doctrine. You waste your time, but don't deny that manifestation. So you use the blood of Jesus, use the name of Jesus and fight because that's what's available to you. And trust God to have results, but never deny manifestations that you cannot understand. While you don't preach it in order to stay accurate, don't deny their possibilities. Glory to God. We are dealing with found fundamentals of spiritual warfare. That's why I'm touching some of these things. You know, one of the most difficult things to do in teaching is balance. People who don't know it, when you are done teaching, they will go and pick something and sit there and start a sermon. <laughs> when I see these things, I laugh because if you know so much, why has God not entrusted authority to you in your generation? You will see them on comment box debating for hours and they are waiting for anybody that will reply like gazelle. So we patch there, typing on Microsoft Word, type a whole book will come out of their debate. <laughs> Yeshua Hamashia Lion of Judah Agune Chimba Number five dimension of battle that we looked at is manipulation. Satan manipulates men so that they can have they can create problem for themselves. Second Chronicles 21 verse 1 the Bible says Satan moved David to number Israel. It was against the law of God, but he was manipulated. You read your Bible, Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5. Satan manipulated Eve and she violated the ordinances of God. These are dimensions of battle. And I took time last week to show you what you need to do to overcome all of them. Please take time to listen to that message again. It will bless your life. And finally, I mentioned that Satan can weaponize your environment. The Bible said in Psalm 121 verse 6, the sun shall not smite you by day. That's not, prophet, that's not a prophetic Bible verse. There are astrologers today who can use the moon to cast pear. Astrologers, they <laughs> The, the constellation, they can manipulate the constellation to darken the possibility of a territory. That's why I was talking to you about atmospheres. When principalities are involved, you must be careful with atmospheres because they can, they can enslave creation. Did you not read your Bible? Romans 8.21, it says creation is in bondage. Anything created now because Jesus has not returned, Satan can manipulate it and use it as a weapon. It's a type of warfare. So you need to understand your own weapons in order to have advantage. And that's why we went to the third phase of our teaching last week and we outlined a few weapons that God has given to us to give us an advantage in battle. And I said number one is the whole armor of God. The Bible says to put on the whole armor of God wherewith you'll be able to withstand all the wires of the devil. So if you are not clothed with the whole armor of God, you have a problem. And remember, he didn't say the whole armor of God will be put on you. He said you put it on. That's how you use the weapon. And he told us about the helmet of salvation. So you need to understand the doctrine of salvation for yourself and let it be your consciousness. Because if you will stand tall in this kingdom, that helmet must be in place. He spoke about the belt of truth. You need to understand the truth of God's word and stand in the truth regardless of what Satan throws at you. He spoke about the breastplate of righteousness. You need to understand righteousness and understand it in context. You know, last week I was talking about <laughs> the meaning of righteousness and somebody got offended. Glory to God. I said, most times, we attempt to preach righteousness, but we end up preaching morality. 
And I stated it clearly that morality is not wrong. And I also stated that I preach it even here. In fact, if you are a revivalist, it will be impossible to preach without addressing morality. What is morality? It is adhering to certain values that are ethical. Values that meet ethical standards. That's what morality is about. But it's not only Christians that advocate for morality. There are many religions of the world that also advocate for morality. So I said morality is good, but it's not the gospel. And somebody got offended that morality is the gospel. I said, no, if morality is the gospel, then every other religion of the world is preaching, is preaching the gospel. Because I can hardly point at any religion who does not advocate for morality. I don't know anyone. But I said, morality is included in the message because it's the byproduct of righteousness. If you understand righteousness, you will live moral. But if you don't understand righteousness and you want to live moral, you will struggle. It's like baiting a pig and telling the pig to be neat. It's impossible. That's what the Old Testament saints tried for 1,500 years. They couldn't. Because you must be righteous before you live righteous. It's living righteous that is called morality. But righteousness itself is first of all a nature that was gifted you by God. That gives you the right to stand in God's presence. So if you don't have the consciousness that you now have God's nature. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him that was without sin to become sin for us. So that we might become, not have, become the righteousness of God. If you don't have the consciousness that now you have the nature of God. And if you don't have the consciousness that you didn't end this nature. It was given you. My son has my nature. He didn't end it. I gave him through biology. There's nothing he would have done to be like me. It was a gift to him. If you don't have this understanding that this is the nature of God gifted you and this gift gives you capacity to relate with God and on the strength of relating with God, you can now live right and you just go ahead to live right, you will struggle a thousand times. So righteousness is first of all about a nature before it is a lifestyle. So when you understand 2 Corinthians 5.21, understand Romans 5.17, then you now go to Ephesians 4.17-24. That now that you have the nature of God, you can't live like the Gentiles. So you need to have your mind renewed by the word of God. And the renewer is coming to understand that you now have God's nature. The renewer is coming to understand that you have the ability to stand in God's presence. The renewer is coming to understand that you now have authority over sin. When your mind is now renewed, then you go to 1 John 3, 7 and 10. That it is in doing righteousness that you manifest truly that you have the nature of God. Do you understand this? So, if you don't know this, you will not have the breastplate. That means your chest will be porous. Arrows can enter you. That's why somebody will stand somewhere and say, that person is a thief. And when they tell you, you are heartbroken. That's why demons can propagate things against you and you want to faint. For those of us who know we are righteous, when they speak against you, you say, who can bring any charge against God's elect? For it is God that judges. It is God that justifies. It is God that condemns. And on the strength of that, the arrows fall. They, they, they become useless. They can't affect you anymore. Meanwhile, all of the dynamics of spiritual warfare with men is around this subject. And I will show you from scripture a moment ago. But many can't succeed because they can't withstand arrows. Arrows. They shoot at them in church. They shoot at them in the market. They shoot at them in the office. And then they carry bitterness. They carry depression. And all of those things become too heavy. Brother, throw those things away. You are the righteousness of God. Nobody can bring any charge against you. There is a race set before you. You, can, you can't move forward unless you travel light. Speed is for those who are light. Go to the marathon. Go to the athletics and see. You don't wear a to run. No, no, no. You need skin tight. You need to be light to be able to run. And for some of us who are not just running but flying, there's no time to contemplate it. Because there are those who are walking, there are those who are running, but some of us, we are flying by the Spirit. We are flying. We are flying. Makakorate tavakaya. You can't fly with weight. 
You cannot fly with weight. Ease yourself of those burdens. When they throw an arrow, let the breastplate of righteousness stop it. That's why I told you, you can't fight until you put on the whole armor of God. And then they said, have your feet shove with the boot, which is the readiness of the gospel. Come in the night, I'm ready. Come in the morning, I'm ready. See, people like us, they don't persuade us to go for evangelism. No. Necessity is laid upon us. People like us, they don't persuade us to give. No. We are sons in the kingdom. We advance the estate of our father. People like us, they don't beg us to pray for kingdom advancement. We live praying, we die praying because all our life, the breath that comes out of our spirit are the utterances and the invocations of the spirit for out of their belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Rivers. It's called the readiness. The readiness. See, some of you are defeated because they need to send you an invitation letter before you go for evangelism. Some of you are defeated because they need to preach a message of prosperity before you give for kingdom advancement. Nobody should motivate you. If it's about kingdom, you know there is a move today on the internet they say they are, they are deceiving men to give. It's an attack on the church that only the gullible will fall for. Have you known any brand in this world today that is not sponsored by billions? Do you think angels will come and preach on the street? You are listening to a message. Do you know what is put together for that message to reach you? As I'm talking to you now, there is a QLX microphone. There are amplifiers at the back there. There are speakers. There are laptops transmitting it to the internet. There is a 200 kVA generator burning diesel every second. You think these things happen just like that? And we are preaching now to more than 30 nations right here, right now. How do you think it works? The gospel rides on the wings of the spirit, but it is carried by the, the, the resources that money can power. It says, cry out loud, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. You allow people to deceive you. Oh, church is brainwashing you. See, there are fake people everywhere, but it doesn't stop us from doing the right thing. In the days of the apostles, the Bible says men sold their lands and brought the money to the apostles' feet so that kingdom can move forward. Are they thieves? There are criminals, but not everybody is a thief. Find out what they are doing and check your spirit. If there's a witness that this thing is about kingdom, please don't allow anybody to persuade you. Be at the forefront. Be at the forefront. Somebody did it so much, they called him son of consolation. The apostles... They nicknamed him. This one is son of consolation. Some people don't know why they are praying, but they are defeated. Because you, don't, you are not wearing boots. And when you enter the jungle, there are, there are spikes. The, those days when we were small, we used to call it chuku chuku. There are chuku chuku on the path. So you will match a lot of chuku chuku. And if you match it, <laughs> you will have injuries. If it's not treated quick, it will decay. So you can't move anymore. That's why your mates, you are seeing your mates go ahead of you say, why am I still here? You are here because you are not wearing boots. But from today, somebody will become equipped with the boot of the spirit. The readiness for advancing the gospel of peace. I come in the volume of the books. It was written about me. I come in the volume, I come in the volume of the books. It was written to do your will. Do your will, oh God. Your first weapon is the whole armor of God. And after you wear the breastplate of righteousness, he said, Take up the shield of faith. You must come to a point where you trust God and God only. Otherwise, you will go down. I told you yesterday, we pray, we fast, we give, we do everything we need to give, but we don't put our trust in any of those things. We trust one and him only. Jesus, the Lord. That's faith. Jesus, the Lord. He's the only Lord. Prayer is not our Lord. Fasting is not our Lord. Giving is not our Lord. Only Jesus is Lord. There's no contesting it. He's sovereign. 
and we believe him. He said, whoever cometh to him must believe that he is. It's not they are. It's he is. There's only one to trust him. Then you will know that is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we pray because we trust Jesus. We fast because we trust Jesus. We give because we trust Jesus. Those things are all a means to an end. Our confidence is in the Lord. The Muslims too pray. The Hindu pray. All the religious of the world fast. So our strength is not the prayer. Our strength is not the fasting. It's our confidence in the Lord our God. Our confidence in Jesus the Lord. He said when you do that, then the Rema word begins to come to you. That's your sword in the spirit. You want to cut off the tongue of the Leviathan, then Rema must come. Rema must come. If Rema does not come, you'll be a victim in battle. This one now is not the scripture you, you meditated. These are the arrows that the Holy Ghost shoots through your spirit man. And so you didn't contemplate it. You showed up, there was battle, and something jumps out of you. And when you release it, it's like a bow in the hands of a mighty warrior. First weapon, put on the whole armor of God. He said, you put it on. It won't be put on you. Please sit down for a moment. Second weapon, I told you, is the name of Jesus. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it there and they are saved. For this cause, God gave him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, the name of Jesus is not just pronouncing it. You can, you can, but coming in the name of Jesus is beyond pronouncing it. It means knowing that you represent Jesus in every situation. When you are talking, you will talk in that name. When you are coming, you will come in that name. You will act in that name. So there's nothing wrong in pronouncing it, but if you don't know that you represent him, even if you pronounce it, nothing will happen. So before you pronounce the name, make sure you are aware that you represent the name. So when you come, Jesus has come. That's what it means to come in the name of the Lord. Coming in the name of the Lord means you are standing in his stead. It's just like somebody comes to stand in the stead of the governor. That's what it means. He will sit where the governor should sit. When they want the governor to talk, he will rise up and talk because he is there on the behalf of the governor. It is first of all representing him, then talking in his name. That's the second weapon that we have. If we will win the battles ahead of us. Number three, I said concerning our weapon, prophetic words. Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their affliction. He sent his word. When the word of the Lord comes to you, you can bank on it with your life. It will never fail. He said heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot or tittle. If that word is animated in your spirit, go and sleep. The battle is over. It will not just give wisdom. It will paralyze the opponent. Prophetic words. All of these things bring you victory. And I spoke about holy living. Ephesians 4.27 is a giving no place to the devil. If you give place to the devil, he will destroy you. Ecclesiastes 10.8 It says if you break the head, the serpent will bite you. So the serpent can bite until you break the head. This is why most people, when the devil is fighting them, he's luring them into iniquity. They think it's a pleasure thing that when they do, they'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. You are sorry, you'll be forgiven. But you will go through a season of torment and pain because you have broken the hedge. You will have to use these principles again to engender victory. So you need to know your enemy, men, wicked men, demons, and principalities, powers, rulers, and of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. You need to understand the dimensions of battle that Satan brings against people. And you also need to know your weapon. Or your weapons. These are the things we dealt with last week. Now, let me show you in the next 30 minutes the dynamics of battle. Both with men, with demons, and then with your flesh. Because when you are dealing with the dynamics of battles... There are dynamics that are men-oriented. 
There are dynamics that are flesh oriented. We call those ones patterns of the bloodline. If you yield to them, you will be cut off. He said the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and the two is one against the other. So there is a warfare going on among men. There is a warfare going on between the flesh and the spirit. If you don't mortify the flesh, although Jesus has taken away the legality, but you will create room and a platform for the devil to subdue you. And then there is an outright warfare going on against spirits. Let's begin with men. My goal for this teaching tonight is to fortify you with wisdom. So I will pick some of these things one after the other, show you how they work, and show you the antidote for each. See, Christianity is a life of devotion and a life of dedication. Don't make any mistake about it. Too. Most people think Christianity is just about coming to church. That's why they have problem. See, we practice life in the spirit. So you must get the scriptures that speaks about the operations and sentence yourself to those scriptures and live out those operations if you will have victory. This is why many will never be delivered. They think the whole thing is just coming to church and declarations are made. There are some battles that you only conquer if you have your own order. I'm telling you, if you like, go to a mountain. They should pour oil on your head. If you are not careful, you will intensify the battle. Because Satan will discover you are now looking for victory. Uh -huh. So they will come against you in a more intense way. There are battles that if you don't have an altar, no matter who prayed for you, at best you have momentary victory. But what will come the next season? It will sweep you off. There are other battles that you will never conquer until you deal with certain fleshly tendencies. So if God wants to give you victory, he will give you laws around your body, your eye, your ear, your tongue. There are certain battles you will never win if you continue to gossip. You will see yourself stagnated for 30 years. And you ask, if you, in fact, sometimes you get offended, blaming everybody. You don't know the root of that battle is that you have pampered flesh. And so long as you continue with that gossip, nothing will deliver you. Because that is the gate the devil uses. There are battles you will never win except as you put bitterness away from your heart. So if the devil wants to enslave you, he keeps causing problems between you and people. And you will not understand. Why is this fasting not working? Why is this anointing oil? Why is this giving not working? Bitterness is the key. If you don't remove it, you will never win. So you need a lot of wisdom and spiritual intelligence if you are fighting in spiritual battles. So let's begin. Battles that are oriented towards men. These are the most treacherous battles as far as warfare is concerned. When men are involved. You know why? <laughs> Sometimes even God is limited when men are involved because they can't override their will. They have jurisdiction in the realm. And then sometimes, the love of God allows him to give them too much room for repentance. And in that season, if you are not strong, you might be plundered. Hope you know, if some witches died 10 years ago, some people would not have died. But the, the love and mercy, they were giving them room to repent. So they don't go to hell. So when it is put on the scales of balances, it's better for the born-again Christian to go home. <laughs> if the born-again Christian cannot fight, <laughs> if you know battles with men, you will be careful. The witch will be allowed mercy to repent. God will be sending prophets to the village to preach. And you, if you don't fight, that witch in the season of their conversion, before they are converted, some born again Christians who don't know how to fight will go home. And the Bible says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the dying of the saints. So God does not endorse it. But at least if the Christian die, the soul is not lost. So if the Christian does not want to die, he must learn how to stand his ground and say, I go nowhere. 
Suffer not the wheat to live. If you don't repent, you will die. It's <laughs> battle. It's battle. Have you not seen many witches? When they repent, they now start confessing. I killed three pastors. I killed two. It will not be you. <laughs> I killed tw 20 Christians. 20 who? Your head will not roll. Your blood will not be spilled. You will stand your ground and live your life to the full. In the name of Jesus. But for you not to fall, learn wisdom. How do you deal with men? Understand the battle and understand the antidote. Number one, how do men fight? They set stumbling blocks in your path. This is why many have not made progress in 10 years. It's not a principality that came up. It's men. Somebody went to your boss and said, watch this guy, you'll be careful. The last time I spoke with him, the ambition I saw, if you are not careful, this guy will bring you down. And that testimony against you that you were not even privy to will become the reason why they will remove your file and put it under the table for 10 years. It's called stumbling block. That's what men do. And it happens even in church. You sit with people that matter. And then somebody comes and sits there and acts as if he's advising you. Be careful. This is your stubbornness. I've seen the way you did like this, did like this. Be careful. Meanwhile, they are sending a message to the person who is your boss to see. Okay. Uh, he's, uh, what did you say he did? Uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. You will think, if you are not discerning, you will think it's advice. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. I will. It's a lie. He's sending a message to your boss so that you'll be destroyed. They are called stumbling blocks. If you don't know it, you'll be a victim. Somebody comes in public and calls your name and says, Kai, you will go far, but uh, maybe this and that, if you can, then you will go far. Meanwhile, he has told everybody that you are a, a bad person. Meanwhile, you will think it's an advice. It's a lie. It's battle. I know this thing. God has opened my eyes to a lot of things. If you don't know how to fight this, whether on your job or in church, you will discover that your work will be slow. You will not know why. Others didn't do half as much as you have done, yet they are promoted. Why are you? They are stumbling blocks. You must master how to remove them. If you don't know how to remove them, you will be in trouble. How do you remove them? Number one, through discernment. There are places you shouldn't go to. Even if you are invited. If you go, you will be vulnerable. That's why I said in Isaiah, I think 30 verse 20. Check it for me. It says if you are in the path, whether be to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you telling you the way that you should go. Because if you are not careful, you will be the one to set yourself up. This is how men fight. You may never see them because they are like serpents. And they will create stumbling blocks. Everywhere you turn, there's a limitation. Sometimes you can go to some places. Don't talk. They will ask you a question. What do you think? Say, hmm. Hmm. It's where? It's where? <laughs> it's where? Because they want to create stumbling blocks in your path. If you will go far, you need discernment. It's not every battle that is fall and die. Oh. That's why most of us have been praying fall and die. We have not moved. Battles that slow you down, sometimes they come in form of stumbling block. But most Christians don't have discernment and wisdom. The Bible said David behaved himself wisely. Wisely before the king. He knew what to say. He knew where to go to. Because he knew that the adversaries are many. The second way to conquer this particular battle is to call upon the name of God. He said, for thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the lifter up of my head. Because stumbling blocks are designed to keep you in one place. So if you don't know how to call upon God, you'll be in trouble. Many are they that have risen up against me. Setting traps all over. He said, but thou, O Lord, you are a shield for me. This is why I told you there are four prayers you must learn how to pray. Number one, Lord, have mercy on me. Number two, Lord, help me. Number three, Lord, thank you.
Because he's doing so much you are not aware of. And number four, keep me in your will. Because men are against... See, those of you who are in corridors of power, you know what I'm saying. You come to work today, your boss is laughing with you, and he said, you know that thing, that project, in two weeks' time, we'll just have it done. Somebody now heard. Hey! So he's the one. The next three days, be wise. They will go to say things. And then you show up the fourth day. The same boss that said, you will do something. You will greet him. He won't answer again. They have set stumbling blocks. They have set stumbling blocks. So when you go home, you know what to do? Go and lock the door. Wear your box and shirt. Be ready for war. Lord, thou that lifted the horn of the helpless, exhort your servant. If you don't know how to pray this prayer, you will enter a pit. Stumbling blocks. Number two. Sit down. I don't have time. How do men fight? They take advantage of your graciousness. This is why you must be careful to be led. If you are not careful, it is your kindness and your graciousness that will kill you. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 to 19, an Amorite king that David was trying to be gracious to, his name was Hanun. He lost somebody and David sent men to give him gifts and to salute him. The guy said, oh, these are spies. And he barbed one part of their head, tore their garment naked and sent them back. What? Have you not been there before? Where you gave somebody water, they say you are a witch, you want to kill him. He won't tell you. The next thing you start hearing, that, oh, look at that one. She gave me water, she think I will drink. I know her. See, be careful who you are kind to. Kindness is a gift, but you must know who to be kind to. See, this is why Christians who don't have a relationship with God, they are like donkeys. They just kill them anyhow. Because they, they set themselves up, they don't know. There are some people you are polite to, it becomes a weapon against you. There are some people you honor, it becomes a weapon against you. They take what you said and thwart it against you and they ensnare you just for loving them, just for honoring them. It's warfare. Do you know how to deal with this battle? Let me show you. Number one, withdraw. Withdraw from such company and straighten the misconception. If you enter any company where they take your graciousness for, for nonsense or they use it against you. Listen, that's why some of the fathers will tell you, go to where you are celebrated. It doesn't mean you should be looking for where they are clapping for you. It means be careful the company you associate with. You are in a place where everybody is trying to use all your kindness, your graciousness, your honor to enslave you and they can do it for a long time. Withdraw yourself. Relationship is not by force. If you allow naivety, you will be buried. And when you are buried, they will preach a sermon with your name. Because it's heartlessness. I've seen it. I'm telling you, withdraw. And then if God allows you, eh, correct every misconception. If you keep quiet where your destiny is being decided, you'll be buried. This is warfare. There is no sentiment. You must be very objective if you will stand. Isaiah 54 verse 17. Hear what the Bible said. See, naive people are victims in battle. It said, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. He said, every tongue that rises against thee, he said, in judgment thou shalt condemn. It's not God that will condemn for you. Don't keep quiet when people are trying to take advantage of your kindness. First of all, withdraw from them and correct every misconception. Let them know you are not stupid. I'm telling you, humility is not timidity. Otherwise, they will keep pushing you down until you are destroyed. And they are happy about it. It's called battle with men. Men can be wicked. I didn't know this before. As a young person growing up, things will happen. They will tell me, go to the public and talk well. You will talk well, they will turn it against you. I had to go back to the Bible. And God told me, if you don't withdraw, you will die. Number two, how do you handle this? 
Don't promote people to your circle who don't qualify. Some of you are here. People come around you who should serve you. You say, you are my sister, my sister. And then you bring them into conversations that they have no business listening to. And the next thing, as they walk out of that conversation, they thwart it and say what you never said. And you will see that there's no confidentiality around your life. That's why you may not go far. If God does not help you, you'll be in trouble. You are doing business. You met somebody on the street yesterday because the person spoke well, spoke kindly. You say, ah, this, this person is a good person. No? And the person sits down. You are discussing your vision that God has not allowed you to speak in public. And the person hears. Before you know what is happening, that same vision, somebody else is living it before you woke up. And then you are wondering what happened. You didn't have discernment to know who should come. How do you think the secular people work? Go and work in some organization. There are corridors where you can't go to unless you are a staff at a certain level. You can never, you can be on the third floor for 10 years. Until you become a director, you will never see the fifth floor. Because they don't have time for all of those things. Before you hear what you should do here, participate in conversation you should participate in and cause problem because you are weak. See, some people don't hate you, but they are not mature. Learn this wisdom oh, because your life and your speed can be truncated because of battles. What you should achieve when you are 12, 20, 30, you are achieving at 60. It's a testimony, but it's also not a testimony. Because you went there late. You would have done much more if you knew what to do. Don't promote people and give them privileges they don't qualify for. Go to, to, to some of these secular men. If they want to have a conversation, they will tell you politely, please, can you wait outside? If they are not disrespecting you, they want to enter a meeting that you don't have credential to be part of. But you'll find Christians, gullible, anybody, some, you meet somebody one week, he comes to your house, he's in your bedroom. He sit down, you are, you are nice. And you are eating with a person in your bedroom. And you don't know why suddenly you and your wife begin to quarrel and quarrel won't finish. Because you allow them to see what they shouldn't see and hear what they shouldn't hear. Don't be gracious and your gracious becomes naivety. Withdraw. Don't promote people who don't qualify to participate in certain level. And number three, don't honor people beyond what they deserve. If you meet somebody that you should shake hands with, shake hands and go away. Make sure whatever you do with people, they should qualify for it. Otherwise, they will use it against you and destroy you. I'm telling you why most of us are struggling in life. If not for mercy, most people would have been destroyed because of the errors they have made. I've been so gracious and I've been a victim. You meet somebody today, he just came, and you're on the altar, he said, my covenant brother. Covenant what? Brother from where? Do you know the meaning of covenant brother? Somebody shows up before you know what is happening. He wants to snap with you. He wants to hug you, and you don't know him. Tomorrow, he puts that picture in his office, and anybody that visits him, he says, yeah, I was my friend the other day, and uh, we were saying some things. We are doing a business. You can be part of it. And uh, this person is part of it and they, they use that picture to swindle people. <laughs> Don't joke. Oh. Warfare is, is a treacherous ground. Only the wise survive. They will stand up and tell you, hey, all these people, they are hard. Oh. See, they are just forming as if they are God. Be joking. When you are naive, you will see the impact. Somebody who is a nobody, you don't know from anywhere. You just are associate and do things with publicly. Before you know what is happening, it will take 15 years out of your journey. Doors will shut against you. You will be reproached. You will be backsli backlisted just because you didn't function in discernment by either promoting those who don't qualify or giving unnecessary honor and credibility to people who don't deserve it. Even those who help you, when you honor them, honor them objectively. I've seen too much danger in functioning without discernment. And I'm teaching you as sons and daughters of this house so that you will learn wisdom. Number three, 
How do you fight the warfare of men? You identify the battle and you know how to fight. The third battle is witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Is intimidation and manipulation designed to compare allegiance through fear. And if you read the Bible, it's littered everywhere. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1 to 23. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 14. Sambalat and Tobias wanted to intimidate Nehemiah until he stopped building the walls of Jerusalem. So they want to force you, compare you, manipulate you, intimidate you until you align to what they are saying. It's a type of battle. And many times, people don't fulfill destiny because of these things. 1 Samuel 18, verse 10 to 11. 1 Samuel 19, verse 1 to 24. King Saul intimidated, first of all, manipulated David by trying to give him his daughter. When manipulation didn't work, he started intimidating him. When intimidation didn't work, he went publicly confronting David to destroy him. It's called witchcraft. And most of us can't go forward today because of these battles. And we don't know what to do. That's why I'm telling you what to do. So that your destiny will count. Some people are not succeeding because their destinies were forced out of their hands. Witchcraft. What is the key in this situation? Number one, focus. Stay on what God told you. Don't let anybody manipulate you out of it. Don't let anybody intimidate you from what God has told you. No matter what they tell you, no matter how they pressure you, tell yourself, this is what God said. If you stay focused to a very large extent, witchcraft will not have power over you. Stay focused. Focus is key on this matter. No matter what they told Nehemiah, they kept building. We will be hearing and building if you won't keep quiet. A point came, they had a sword on one hand and they were building on the other hand. The building must continue. Don't let anybody manipulate you out of what you are doing. See, they come with manipulation. If manipulation does not work, they bring intimidation. They try to put fear. If intimidation does not work, they go confrontational. See, fail doing what God told you. It's an honorable way to fail. For you to succeed in what God didn't tell you, better fail in what God told you. I told somebody some, some years ago, I said, if what I'm doing here fail, I will go to another city and continue doing it. Didn't you read the life of Paul? Paul entered some city, they kicked him out. He kept preaching. He said, let's go to the next city. He entered another city, they stoned him to death. He stood up, he said, let's go to the next city. If you remain focused, you will succeed. If you remain focused, you will break witchcraft. Most times we lose our focus. Don't talk about what is happening. Don't even have time for it. Channel your energy on what God has asked you to do. And as you keep doing it, a point will come. Your resort will stop the witchcraft. Pastor Chris taught us many years ago. He said when they want to force you, he said you keep growing. A day will come you will grow too big to be concealed. A day will come you will grow too big to be intimidated. Your greatest error will happen to you when you stop growing. And you stop growing when you stop focusing on what God told you. Stay on course. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. One day, if God doesn't vindicate you, your results will prove that those people are not serious. I'm telling you. Too many people are not focused. Any little thing, they go off track. God told you, go to a city, raise an altar. You show up, somebody comes and tell you, my brother, relax. Over four people have come here. If I will advise you, do this, do that. And they manipulate them to live what God told them. And others come, they put fear in them. It will not work. This has happened, this has happened. Forget all of those things. Withdraw from those things. Focus on what God told you. If you fail, it's your fault. Oh. You won't go to heaven and say, it's this person that made me to. Stay on track. I can't tell you enough the power of focus. If some of us were not focused, we will not be here. Witchcraft. There's so much to say, but we don't have time. Number four, the battle with men. After witchcraft, you now have conspiracy. 
conspiracy. See, these are the things men deal with every day. And they don't know why they are not rising. They don't know why they are not making progress. It's because they either take it for granted or they didn't discern it. One of the ways Satan shuts men down is through very potent operations, programmings of conspiracy. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1 to 28. The moment the king made Daniel president of the realm, all the princes gathered against him. And they created a conspiracy around him. First of all, manipulating the king to do something that Daniel's conviction will never allow him. And before you know what was happening, they hinted the king that the guy didn't do it. So that he will be thrown to the lion's den. If you don't know the operations of conspiracy, you will be shocked too. Genesis 37, verse 12 to 36. Joseph's brother conspired, brothers conspired against him. Unless you are not going anywhere. If you are going somewhere, you will fight some or all of these battles. Telling you. People will just gang up against you for no reason. Sometimes they use your mistakes. Sometimes they lie against you. Sometimes they create a system that you must fall to. But by all means, they want to stop you. It's called conspiracy. A confederacy of men against you ensuring that you don't make progress. How do you deal with it? Number one, maintain your devotion to God. Don't join politics because of conspiracy. You will give a reason for you to fail. Even though they ganged up against Joseph, he never joined them for once. When they sinned, he will say it to the father. This and this and this is what they are doing. Don't go and become a politician because they conspired against you. You will lose because even if you join them through politics, you are not one of them. They know. The best thing you can do for yourself is maintain your devotion. When they conspired against Daniel, the Bible said three times a day, the man kept his devotion. Nothing changed it. And through to the plans they had, Daniel was thrown to the lion's den. But what happened? The lion suddenly couldn't eat. Because that devotion is what will save you. Many people back out on God because of conspiracy. You are in your workplace, they conspire against you. The next day you are in Babalawo's house. You will die. They conspire against you. The next thing, you are consulting with people, trying to use the ways of flesh to vindicate yourself. You can't go anywhere. The first thing to do is to maintain your devotion to God. The second thing to do is to keep your heart pure. Because if you corrupt your heart, your priesthood will become impotent. You may know who said what. Don't bother. Tell yourself, it's the devil using them. No matter who, no matter what, tell yourself, it's the devil using them. Keep your heart pure. Because whether God will vindicate you or not, it's the texture of your heart you will consider. If your heart is affected, you have lost. That's how to fight in the midst of conspiracy. Number three, what do you do? See a higher purpose in what is happening. If you are the least, nobody will fight you. You are being fought because you are the head. And so what do you do? Build a consciousness around that higher purpose. And begin to function from that higher purpose. And the day will come, you will leave all your conspirators. You know what David, Joseph said? Much later when he met his brothers, he said, you meant it for evil. He said, God meant it for good. He sent me ahead so that I will preserve a generation. That's how to think. Don't go and do politics. Don't allow your heart to be corrupt. Stay in your devotion to God and see a higher purpose. That's how to dismantle conspiracy. A point will come when they see that you don't care, they will become threatened. And not too long, they will start fighting in their camp. Because when you start making certain progress, some people will say, oh, well, this guy, they move on. You will notice that betrayers will begin. Some will come and tell you, is this person that said this? I don't know. Still don't join them. Say it's where, it's where. Don't say anything. It's where, it's where. Keep going, keep going, keep going. The time to talk is when you become the prince of Egypt. When they come to buy food, that's when you will sit down and say, who are you? Who do you know me? <laughs> that's when to talk. Some of you talk too early. You are still in Potiphar's house. You are talking. Oh God, you have not grown yet. 
You have not grown. Still maintain consciousness. Maintain consciousness. Some of you talk too early. You are the head of the prisoners. You are talking. Wait. Wait. The Bible said until the time that his word came. There is a time to talk. He said the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent forth to lose him. Until the status of royalty come. Don't speak. When that time come, they will come to you for survival. And when they come, they prove that your heart was not bitter. Help them. Don't insult them. Help them. But let there be a situation when you tell them, I am the one you threw into a pit. I'm the one you sold to the Egyptians. But you see, you thought you wanted to kill me. But God was sending me on an errand. God was sending me on an errand. That's how to function, brothers and sisters. Most of you sank in conspiracy because your heart became bitter. Don't look at Martha. Don't look at Jay. Don't look at Victor. Don't look at Gabriel. Look unto the hills. From whence cometh your help. Your help cometh from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He will not allow your feet to be moved. Him that keepeth Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. What I'm preaching now, see, some of you it looks like I'm telling the story of your life because the journey of greatness is the same. So if these things are happening to you, don't cry, brother, celebrate. It means you are part of the great. Don't cry, brother, celebrate. It means you are part of the head. You are part of the leaders. You are part of the champion. But there is a technology of wisdom and discernment. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Only you, only you be praised. Let only you be praised. Let only you be praised. Let only you be praised. Yahweh, you will be praised. Yahweh, you will be praised. Oh. Yahweh, you will be praised. Yahweh, you will be praised. Sit down, sit down. See. These things I'm telling you, write them down and practice them. Some of you are in the middle of conspiracy now. Take one month. I will not be bitter. I refuse to be bitter. I refuse to allow resentment. I refuse wickedness. That's where the battle is. Oh. Don't go and face Peter, face Timothy, face Martha and say, can you imagine? You will kill yourself. The battle is not with them. It's in your heart. I refuse anger. I refuse hatred. I refuse bitterness. God is using this because I'm going somewhere. And I will keep going there. A day will come when I will sit on my throne. And then I will provide deliverance unto Jacob. Don't do, don't be bitter. Don't let it affect your devotion. Some of you is even in church. You are in the choir. You are in the ushery. You are serving God. Before you know what is happening. Five people have built a system against you. And suddenly you are like an outcast. Don't come and say, well, since they don't want me there anymore, I'm out. Let them do it the way they want. You are falling. If anybody can kick you out, it means that person is your God. Brothers and sisters, as far as this thing I'm doing is concerned, only God can fire me. And I know by mercy he will never do it. No man can fire me from what I'm doing. If you think you're offended, I will do it a thousand times more. If I was coming early and it annoyed you. If I was singing with all my heart and it annoyed you. If I was praying with all my heart and it annoyed you. You are about to die. Because I will not stop. I will not lower my devotion to God. If I was serving well and it annoyed you. If I was giving and it annoyed you. I will do it more and more. Because I'm not worshipping man. I'm worshipping God. I'm not serving man. I'm serving God. And I'm not concerned about what you think. I'm concerned that at the end of time, he will say, thou faithful servant, thou faithful, thou good and faithful servant. That's my focus. Yeah, 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 yeah.
This is why I began by telling you, see, we are hardworking people. We are intelligent people. But we don't understand the forces of the realm. That's the problem. That's the problem. And this is why your priesthood must be alive. Because you can't find peace that surpasses knowledge without prayer. He said, be anxious for nothing. He said, but by all things, by prayer and supplication, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, with thanksgiving, he said, let your request be made known unto God. And he said, the peace of God that surpasses knowledge will garrison your heart. Guard your heart from bitterness. Guard your heart from resentment. And then keep your devotion to God. And see what God will do. That's when you will see the vindicator rise up for you. And the way God vindicates men, he won't come and join the argument and say he's right. No. He will take you from the prison to the palace. <laughs> That's why you shouldn't bother yourself who is right or wrong. Keep your gaze on God. Even when he vindicates you, he won't come and join the argument. He will take you to the palace. We are scepter stock. Dealing with battles amongst men. These are the reasons why great men never become. Treachery in human relationship. Number five is when men show you false love in order to make you compromise your standards. False love. Judges 16 verse 4 to 21. All of the law of Delilah was showing Samson was so that he would compromise his consecration. And the moment he compromised and the hair was barbed, shaved, the Philistines showed up. See, you can't be weak. Oh. When the Bible says if you faint in the day of trouble, your strength is little. This is why. Some of you, the moment people smile at you, you throw your value systems away. Because somebody hugs you, you too will take bribe. Because somebody took you to his house and you had dinner, you will join the liars. Don't let any false love make you compromise. Even your prayer will become impotent. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2. See the love they showed the Hebrew boys. All of it was to make them eat food given to idols. Or to make them bow to idols. But the young man told the king, Thank you for making us princes. But we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Our devotion is stronger than the affection you are showing. He said, our God is able to save us. In case he refuses, we will not bow. If it is choosing between your affection and our devotion to God, we will keep our values. Let that relationship end. People who are weak, the fastest way they compromise is by showing them false love. Before you know, they said, you, 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 or God wants to see you. Huh? They say, yes, come to the house. There's a dinner, and you are the only three, or God says, you come. You come, they, they put you on the table, or God will come and tap you on the back. How now? What did they happen? Do one or fun, two, three funny things with you. On Monday, you come, they say, there's a deal. And because or God tapped you at the back, took you for dinner, you can't stand your ground anymore and say, sir, I'm a Christian. We don't do this. Because you want to keep the pampering of a guy. And you don't know demons are waiting for you to compromise. The moment you compromise, you will discover that the hyenas were waiting. They were waiting for you to create a loophole. And when they come, they will tear you apart. Cancer will come from nowhere. Suddenly your faith can't rise anymore. Suddenly, they say, oh, this one is sick. This one is in the hospital. You can't rise anymore. You have compromised. Did you read something? He shook himself as at other time. The power is in the devotion. The moment you compromise, you lose the seven locks, which are the seven spirits of God. The secret of your power. That's what Satan is looking for when he tells you to compromise. For some of you, it's favor. You don't know that favor is your dreadlocks. When you're not compromised, suddenly that favor, something happens to it. Some of you, is wisdom. What men struggle with, you show up, you just know. And you don't know, those are your powers. 
It's not human sentiment and human affiliation. Keep your devotion so that your powers can stand. You know, most of you don't know the real battles of life. Ask those who are functioning among kings. They will tell you. Because when a king smiles at you, he makes you think it's a privilege. And if he smiles at you, he will make a demand of you the next day. God help you to refuse. You will see the disdain that will come from him. How dare you? Is it because I condescended to relate with you? You need to let him know that you are a king among men. I serve a king that is eternal. My values are higher than your smiles. You can never make me compromise. Because your life is not in the hand of that king. Your life is with God. The day you compromise, you put your life in the hands of men. This is the battle of men. Finally, it's false narratives. When men want to kill you, this is the most difficult one. When I was studying the Bible, most times, in this case, the people are actually destroyed unless God shows up. The battle of false narratives. When Satan tries everything and he can't get you, he will go for your name. And he will build an army that will raise false narratives against you. Go and read your Bible. See everywhere this thing happened to men. If God didn't show up, they were finished. Number one, Genesis 39, from verse 6 to 20. Joseph in Potiphar's house. <laughs> the way the situation will be curated, you won't even have a defense. Imagine the story of Joseph. What were you doing in the master's bedroom? Is that the kitchen? Nobody knew that the woman called him. How did you take off your clothes? Why is your shirt in her hand? There is no defense. The man ended up in prison for 14 years. That's the power. Because when the devil wants to create a false narrative, he can take two years to build a structure around it so that everybody's sentiment will be swept when the narrative is, narrative is given. You, it will take you to prison. Look at another scripture. Jezebel and Naboth when they wanted to take Naboth, Naboth's vineyard. Read the Bible. You will learn things that will shock you. It will help you understand how to live today. See Jesus in Pilate's house. Matthew 6, 59 to 68. Mark 14, 55 to 65. This man said, he will destroy the temple that took 46 years to build. He desecrated our God. That's not the place to come and say, no, I was talking in parables. They don't care whether it's parables. <laughs> it's at the resurrection that the Holy Ghost will interpret it. But now, you will be slaughtered. But this is what God does. And this is what you should anchor on. When false narratives are given about you, number one, plead the blood. That's why when the accuser of the brethren released his ministry, the only way they overcame, he said, it was by the blood of the Lamb. If you don't know what to do with the blood, you are finished. Though. This is why I advise Christians, as much as it's within your power, break communion, break bread. Because that is what makes the angel of death to pass over. So when you engage the blood, all of a sudden, the narrative will be there, but it will mean nothing. It will become like the council of Ahitophel. It, people will see it and just trash it. And you will not know what happened. That's the blood exonerating you. Because if God does not vindicate you, ah, it will be difficult for you. It is in the context of the of false narratives that men become legal captives. And only the sovereignty of God will deliver a lawful captive. Isaiah 49 verse 24, it says, Shall the lawful captive be delivered? Shall the prey be taken from the hands of the mighty? He said, Thus hear the Lord. Even the captive of the mighty shall be delivered and the prey of the terrible. Imagine that your, your, your oppressor is called the terrible oppressor. It will take the sovereignty of God to deliver you. 
But these are the battles you will fight as you deal with men. In case you didn't get the things I said, take this summary for your deliverance. Number one, you need wisdom from above. All the things I'm talking about, discernment is centered around wisdom. Proverbs 11 verse 9 says, through knowledge, through the functional wisdom of God, it says the just shall be delivered. Number two, sustain the right heart posture. Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph said you meant it for evil, but God turned it for good. Number three, build tenacity in truth and integrity. Genesis 39 verse 9, I will not do this evil and sin against God. Don't let it make you change your values. If your values change, you have lost. Stand your ground in truth. It's better to sink standing on truth than to live a lie. And then number four, trust God for his vindication by applying to his mercy. Lamentation 3.22, it says, for the lost mercies that we are not consumed, his compassion faileth not. This is how to deal with the warfare that involves men. Now, there is still battle with flesh. And there is still battle with demons and devils. Imagine the kind of life that we are in. Do you see why most times, out of 100 people, only three make it? Because the battles are many and the frontiers are enormous. All we've been saying since is battle with men. We have not entered battle of flesh and patterns of the bloodline. We have not entered battles with devils. Meanwhile, some people can't scale this battle among men. Some can't survive it. They've sunk long time ago. Ten minutes. Let me run through the rest. The Holy Ghost will give us understanding. Operations of the flesh or dealing with battles of the flesh. That's what I call patterns of the bloodline. And like I told you already, the finished works of Christ has removed every legality that the devil stands upon to afflict us. But if we create opportunities for Satan through the flesh, he will show up and we will become victims. This is why many generations, although Christians, you can still trace demonic oppression because there are patterns of the bloodline. There are operations of flesh that they've not dealt with. I've, I've showed you many times how Abraham loved fair women, Isaac loved fair women, Jacob loved fair women. And Abraham lied to Abimelech, Isaac lied to Abimelech. So there were patterns. Abraham couldn't endure famine. He ran to Egypt. Isaac ran to Egypt. So what Satan does is, you have given your heart to Christ. Yes, I don't have power over you. Yes, but I will wait for the weaknesses of the flesh so that you will open the door for me to enter. Paul said in Ephesians 4.27, he said, give no place to the devil. If he comes, he will plunder you. But the way we give place to the devil are through fleshly weaknesses that we have not dealt with. And if you want to really come out of these battles, you will, there are certain priesthood procedures that you must follow. Glory to God. Priesthood procedures. But let me show you certain patterns quickly that are happening to people. Number one, spirit molestations, mostly in dreams. Some people, progress is in front of them. The door is to open tomorrow. They will have the same dream a night before and everything shatters. And they can tell you this thing has repeated five times without fail. Some, the night before that opportunity, they will find themselves molested sexually. And the next day, that thing must scatter. Come what may. There are some that spirits come to literally molest them sexually. And they, are, they will be tormented for years. That's why I began by telling you there are certain things that may be difficult to explain doctrinally, but never doubt their manifestation. They are called patterns of the bloodline. Some is death. The moment you enter 32, 
and you will see it. It has happened to three people. 32, one week before birthday or two weeks after birthday, cut off. And you are wondering what's going on. Patterns of the bloodline. Satan is taking advantage of a weakness to create a line of oppression in that bloodline. It's not something you just come out and say it can't happen, it can't happen. If you don't deal with that gate, it will happen whether you like it or not. Because you are the one who has made him Lord and he will exact his lordship. Because to him whom you yield yourself, servant to obey, the servant of him you are whom you have obeyed. So if you create a door, when Satan comes, don't blame him when he carries out his government. So there are patterns that we allow Satan to enact because of our fleshly operations. Some is terminal diseases. You just find out that every generation people have diabetes. Has nothing to do with sugar. Grandfather diabetic, father diabetic, son diabetic. Diagnosed from birth and you are wondering what is this? Patterns. Some is madness. The moment they get to 23, they just go mad. And you are saying, what's going on? It's a pattern. It's not something you just fade away. There is a priesthood technology for dealing with it. The problem many Christians have that make them frustrated is that they are quoting scriptures when they should deal with reality. So when we quote scriptures, we are not wrong. But there must be a corresponding life that supports the scripture we are quoting. Otherwise, we are making caricature of ourselves. How do you deal with patterns of the bloodline? Number one, you must take time to study the pattern and understand it. 2 Corinthians 2, 11, Paul said, we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil, lest he will have an advantage over us. If you don't know the pattern, you won't even know what you are fighting. And you will not con concentrate your attack against Satan. If it is dead, sit down, study the cycle, understand it. Because if that season comes, that angel of death will show up. But you will be ready before he shows up. Because you have studied the cycle. If you don't know the cycle, you won't even know when to prepare. So you must first of all understand the cycle. Why is it that every six months I must fornicate? So when five months approaches, you take cover. If you don't know the pattern, you can't win. So the first thing is to understand the pattern. Number two is to shut every gate of intrusion that Satan has. Because if you don't shut those fleshly gates, if Satan comes, that's the door he will always use. And many people are making declarations, but gates are open. The gate of alcoholism is open. The gate of womanizing is open. The gate of madness is open. The gate of unforgiveness is open. The gate of gossip is open. And they are declaring, it shall not happen again. It shall not. Satan doesn't bother himself with such people. When he comes, the gate is porous. He will just enter, do what he wants to do and go out. Keep singing your song. So, after you discern the pattern that fortifies you with an understanding of the possible map, knowing the seasons where things will happen, begin to lock gates. I told you my story. When I was praying against certain patterns in my family, I stood in my room praying and suddenly my eyes opened. I saw two creatures appeared in my room. One had ten horns. The other one looked like a man that was exhumed from the grave, partly decaying. You look, you see skeleton and other things. What is the meaning of this? And the Holy Ghost started speaking to me. He said, these are the beings that has controlled the destiny of men in your lineage. I said, but I'm born again. And the Holy Ghost told me, there are forces of flesh that has been instituted in your bloodline that gives them an advantage. And he mentioned four. He said, number one, lying. Number two, pride. Number three, drunkenness. Number four, womanizing. Go and check your lineage. You will hardly find a man who doesn't do one, two, or all of these things. That's why when these beings come, they are helpless. While we were here talking, the war disappeared and we're standing in my compound. And the Holy Ghost told me to deal with them. You must not allow these manifestations in your life. So I know this thing. You use the blood, you use the finished work, but you must not allow 
the consecration that those spirits have brought into your lineage. Because those things you call flesh, they are actually their own worship. So in my family, if you are womanizing, you are worshiping those beings. If you are lying, you are worshiping. And I checked, pride is like a DNA. Even people who are small, when they look at you, in fact, they used to address us as a pabana. You know what that means? Thunder. So you see a small boy walking, they will look at it, Papana. <laughs> when you are three years old, if you can drink four cups of, of pan wine, they will say, this one is a man. In fact, they will say it like prophecy. So, when, <laughs> when we were small, so when, 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 when occasion is happening, you will see a small boy come, they will give you a cup. When you put it, you won't drop it. If you drop it, Kai, you are a weak man. You will drink it until the whole cup is empty. When you drop it, you hear a cup and a... <laughs> you, you will look at, you are a warrior. And then they are checking how much you can drink and still stand gallant. Meanwhile, those are devotion to powers. And then you are seeing death. You are seeing stagnation. You can't trace it. You are praying. Nothing is changing. Because for it to change, you must shut the gate. There is a worship going on in darkness that you must stop. Because you can't serve two masters. You are worshipping the devil and you are asking God to take him away. You gave your allegiance to him. So God taught me. He said, shut those gates. Shut those gates. If I venture into any of those things and as much as make it a practice, I know my end has come. Because those beings, they will always keep to, they will keep to calendar. He said, Satan left Jesus for a season. They always come back. They never miss their timetable. So when you study the pattern, you can tell when Satan will come. You can tell. In my house, between March and May, there is a problem. And if you miss it, you'll be shocked. You can trace it. As in, it's so precise and you are wondering, what is this? There are patterns. And so the first act of priesthood is to discern the pattern. The second is to shut it. This is why if you must preach to people, preach to them. It's not everything you pray on the altar and say, I cover my mother, I cover my brother. Get them submitted to God first. When they are submitted to God, then you can begin to enforce the finished works of Christ. If you don't shut the gate, you will be quoting scriptures and you will be wondering why they are not working. Because you are quoting scriptures to people who are worshipping Satan. So, identify the pattern, shut the gate, enforce the finished works of Christ. This is where you come and you say, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. When I'm saying it, I know Satan cannot do anything because he's the accuser. He won't have any ground. They overcame him. I know. See, every one of you sitting here, if you take time to study, you will trace the pattern in your own bloodline. If you take time to study, you will know the gates that Satan uses. Some of you that are sitting here, if you see money, your whole body begins to shake. If it's money, they don't need to advise you. You will compromise looking for who we give you. And you are wondering what's going on? Patterns. Patterns. And the devil will make sure that consecration is kept so that when it comes, he has authority. So before you start declaring what Christ has done, Make sure gates are locked. Gates are locked. If gates are not locked, although Satan overcome, yet in your own life, he will have victory. When you now shut the gates and you begin to enforce the finished works of Christ, finally, make demand of mercy. So that in case there is anything you have not done, the sovereignty of God will override it. He said to subvert a man in his cause. He said the Lord that proveth not. These are the four priesthood requirements for dealing with bloodline patterns. And I call it, blood, I call it bloodline because their manifestations are peculiar to families. And their manifestations are authorized by fleshly weaknesses. This is the priesthood channel. Identify the pattern. Know when the occurrences are possible so that you mount your defense in priesthood. Then, shut the gates of flesh through consecration to God. Then, enforce the finished works of Christ. Then, stand on the mercy of God. 
If you do this, anything that flesh sponsors will end in your life automatically. And I can tell you, many people, it's no, nobody's fighting them. It's themselves fighting themselves. The moment he has money, his throat becomes dry. He's looking for alcohol. He, no, there's no party. He just go and sit down on his own and start drinking. And when he drinks, dark inspirations come. He begins to violate ordinances of God. There are some ladies here. The moment they have money, they'll say they want to go on, 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 on holiday. Or they go to hotel. Ladies, some go to club. And you are wondering why that affliction won't end. You are the one who opened the gate. There are some men here, the moment they have money, they are running to a brothel. And you are wondering, 40 days fasting, they finish, they go to brothel. Satan will allow you, if you like fast, let smoke come out of your head. He will wait for you in the brothel because you are coming there to drop your crown. Instead of casting your crown before the king of kings, you are casting your crown before the god of fornication. Warfare. Don't joke with it. This is why great men are going nowhere. Great women are going nowhere. He said, I've seen an abomination under the sun. He said, princes are trekking. Beggars are riding on horses. Finally, on the dynamics, is operations of Satan. We're out of time. Hmm. Ah, we're out of time. Now, let me add this. The second way to deal with patterns of the bloodline is through service. After priesthood, you now have service. I'm telling you, see, if there is a snare on your family and one, at least one person is not sold out to God, everybody in that family will be wiped out. If you have time, go and check. Families that have fought battles. One person must be, become a, a priest of God. You must be dedicated. God will choose. I'm telling you. See, everybody will serve God though. But one person will become a, a living sacrifice. Because one of the ways you break those things is through committed service. You become like a burnt offering. That's what stops it. That's why Ephesians that we read already. 6.15, it said the readiness, the boot is the readiness of the gospel. Service. Why do you think you see some men, they are millionaires, they are still ushers in church. You say he's humble, he's humble. He has nothing to do with humility. That service is his weapon. He knows how many businesses he did that crashed. But the moment he started serving God, he saw that he started skyrocketing. He now discovered that his insurance was his service. So that service became a memorial to God. You come to some places, you see billionaires. They say they are going for evangelism, they are the first. Saturday, four, they are there. They leave every business. Meanwhile, these are people that every one hour has implication in millions. And you see them on the street. Sometimes they are even doing caricature. They are playing. You see small boys, they'll say, this is my leader. And the small boy will be saying, you know, uh, the Lord... You don't have an idea. You don't have an idea. That man is fighting a war. And the key to that war is service. So even if it means he should bend down for his grandson, he will do it. As far as he's concerned, he's not seeing that boy. He's seeing God. It's God he's serving. And so long as he's serving, the fortress is around him. Nothing can penetrate. Nothing can penetrate. He has found the key. Service to God. That's how you hide yourself in Christ. You hide yourself through absolute devotion to God. But some of us here, we are fighting battles and we can't serve. You can't come for church, for church service. You can't go for evangelism. You can't give for kingdom advancement. You are nowhere to be found. You will end up lamenting and lamenting and lamenting. The day I became sold out to God, my life became a mystery. We literally slept in church now. Is it intelligence? Is it gift? By the mercies of God, we had little. Little that anywhere we go, you know somebody came. But nothing was working. 
With master's degree, I was teaching chemistry as HOD. You will dictate the whole note from your brain, yet you are earning 20,000. Meanwhile, this 20,000, your, your transport, which is bike, is 14,000. Who out there you think of driving a car? What is going on? There are forces that won't let you rise. When I discovered the way of service, I plugged in. We will go for crusade. We will not even accept to sleep in hotel. We will sleep on the crusade ground. Arrange the chair, sleep there. A point came, we became burnt offering. If you touch us, you touch God. And things broke out from every side. That's how God preserves people. Service, service. You sing it, people never get it. It's not about the pastor. It's first of all about God and about your future. Look at what Malachi 3 said from verse 17. Let's read that as I go forward. Go to verse 16. Let me begin from there. It said, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, like we are doing now. And the Lord hearkened and heard. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. This is prayer. This is priesthood. This is worship. Go to the next verse. You now see service. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spared his own son that does what? So there is a place for the sons that serve. It's a key. You don't know why no business is breaking through. You don't know why the nations are not opening. You don't know why you are not something. There's a battle you are fighting you are not aware. And the key is service. Those of us who travel, we see things and I, I keep sharing it. Sometimes you go to preach. The person who comes to pick you from the airport, you will know that it's, it's a miss. <laughs> you will see a man in his 60s who is the, a, a, an owner of a business. He will say, sir, sir. When I discern them nowadays, I'll say, don't worry. I'll carry my iPad myself. <laughs> because their life begins to challenge me. What do they know? You want to break forth? Not just in material things, but even in spiritual things. Service is a weapon. Learn it. It's a key for breaking warfare that troubles family lines. Finally, dealing with Satan. I'll just show you the operations that Satan uses to put people in captivity that you must fight. Number one is that it darkens the understanding of men. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 4. The understanding of men darkened. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. He darkens their understanding. He says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. How were they lost? The God of this world blinded their minds. So when you discover that you are finding it so difficult to understand simple things, it's a warfare. You are not so dull. There are most people, they struggle at those days in school. I used to be irritated with some. You are explaining two plus two. You will explain it ten times. They are still writing and making mistakes. You are wondering. One definition, they will write it on 12 sheets of paper. Cram it for three days, they still can't get it. And you are, what, what is in your head? It, see, you will see that these people are genuinely hardworking. Trying to understand, but they can't. They will be sweating when you check what is happening. They are trying to prove Charles' law. Ah! You know that there is a power. The mind has been darkened. How many of you met such people? <laughs> when you are writing an exam, you will see them sweating. You will see them sweating. Some even carry leakage everywhere. Even the leakage is wrong. <laughs> they are cheating, but the material, the copy to cheat with is also wrong. Everybody finishes the exam. You see them sweating. When you come, you think they are rounding up. They are on number one. Then they will now write, Lord Jesus, deliver your servant. 
they are darkened. It's, it's a battle. Don't joke. Some of you hearing me here, that's your battle. But you took it for granted. If you have studied hard and this thing is not coming through, ask more questions. Because if you study, you should understand. So what do you do? Enter prayer. He says, if you lack wisdom, James 1, 5, ask of him that giveth liberally and unbraided not. This is where you add prayer. Because there's something prayer does about enlightenment. Ephesians 1, 17, he said, for this cause, I bow my knees to the Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding might be illuminated. So some people have a darkened understanding. If you want it to open, enter prayer. And if you pray, 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 it's not working. Look for who has the grace. Let him lay hands on you. Because things can be transferred. My little children, of whom I travel again in prayer, that Christ be formed. That's one. Then number two, I long to see you that I may impart unto you spiritual graces in the end that you might be established. So you can do it by prayer or you do it by impartation. See, all impartation is not to cast out devils. So it's not to heal the sick. There are some impartation that opens your mind up so that you can access the wisdom of God. Are you following? Warfare. Some of you think warfare is just to pray, set and die, set and die. You are joking, no? There is a dynamic for dealing with, 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 with entities that battle your destiny. Number two, what does Satan do? Lawlessness. He plants lawlessness in the souls of, of some. Have you seen some people who from morning to night, they are only thinking evil. And they didn't grow into it. From primary two, they have been treacherous. They are evil geniuses. It's a battle in some bloodline. And demon uses it for, on some people. They just love everything that is lawless. A child is one year, he comes, kicks everything. He goes to class, he, he, he stabs somebody with pen. And you are wondering, where did you learn it? It's a battle. And he grows up with that lawlessness. Ephesians 2 verse 2, see what the Bible said. He calls them those who are under the power of the prince of the air. He said, wherein in time past, you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. And the same can apply to a believer if he opens the door to Satan. That's why some people think only chaos. They think only breakdown of law and order. They can't seem to do the right thing. Even when they are trying, they are struggling. It's the spirit of lawlessness. It's an attack. And when you are lawless, even God becomes careful to commit things to your trust. He said, cast not holy things to the swine. He will trample it underfoot. Mm. Number three, fear and torment. Now, how do you deal with lawlessness before I proceed? It's by submitting to God. James 4, 7. And also by following those who have a track record of order in their lives. Hebrews 6, 12. He says, follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. If you find out that you just love lawlessness, ask God to help you submit to him. He said, when you submit to God, you will resist the devil. Or follow those who have order in their lives. Follow them. As you are following them, listening to them, they are imparting you, you are observing them, you see that your life starts being gathered. That's how you deal with lawlessness. Then you have fear and torment. I've said, I've said that already. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, himself likewise took part of the same, that he might deliver them from what? The power of death, even the devil. And he says so that they who for a lifetime were subject to bondage through fear might be delivered. So fear torments people. And I showed you how to break out of it by staying stirred up. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. When you are stirred up, you begin to function by the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Number four, sickness and affliction. These are the things Satan uses. 
So when you are fighting Satan, you must understand that his battle approach is different from when you are fighting flesh. And it's also different from when you are fighting men, wicked men. Some of us generalize everything. Everything is fall down and die. That's why we are not making progress. Some battles are intrinsic. Like this lawlessness. The devil weaves it into you. You are the architect of your misfortune. So if you are not gathered, no matter the impartation, you will go nowhere. And then fear. People are paralyzed before they start. He is the most qualified person, but he can never see himself make a move. When you talk, he's thinking you are talking to another person. No, you are the one. Stand up. He will stand up. He will be shaking. His voice will be shaking. Uh, oh, oh, uh, yes. Uh, the whole thought will vaporize because fear has ensnared him. And that is his opportunity for destiny. So the devil doesn't need to come every night and torment him. He just plants fear in him so that he misses his season. A king shows up. People who should shift him are sitting. They say, sir, what do you have to say? I don't have anything. Before he spoke, his heart came out of his mouth. And windows pass, windows pass. Those are people, you will see them, you will think you need to lay hands on them. No, fear, fear, fear has paralyzed them. That's why in, in this place, when we see that people have anything on their life, we push them to the altar. There are some of them, the first time they came to take offering. To walk from their seat to the altar is like climbing Mount Everest. And when they carry the mic, they will stutter 30 times in five minutes. I say, stay there. It's either that fear kill you or you kill it. <laughs> After three months, you see them. They now come up and stand like bishops. Can we turn to Malachi? So you too now can say, can we turn? If you don't confront your fears, they will kill you. It's a battle. He wants to deny you of your opportunities. Your seasons will pass. You can't rise. It's a battle. Demons are intelligent. Don't joke with them. Then, poverty. After sickness, you are poverty. See, there are people that are afflicted with chronic poverty. They have the best vision, but nobody can hear it. You know, I pity people who think wealth is all about hard work. I believe in hard work. Oh. I've taught you about universal prosperity. From investments, to giftings, to productivity, to invention to inheritance I know all of that but if Satan is involved you'll be shocked there is a spiritual dimension to money and to wealth there are people that are afflicted not with sickness with poverty look at Job's life everything he had was swept off by Satan John 10 10 the devil cometh not but for to kill to steal and to destroy that's Satan for you. He makes some people poor. In 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul said, we desire to come to see you. But the devil shut the door. So there is a fight against poverty. It's an attack in some cases. When you apply all the universal principles, investment, creativity through wisdom, deploying your gift, and it's not working, check the spiritual side. Something is wrong. This is battle. How do you deal with it? Number one, accept the blessings of the gospel. Accept it. Let it become your reality. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Accept it. In 1 Corinthians 3.21, He says, All things are yours. Accept it. He said that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you. If you want to fight poverty, accept everything God has given to you. There is a gospel going around now that God does not make men rich. Huh. If it is true, then never pray to God to bless you because if you pray, you are a hypocrite. You know, when we want to attack ourselves, we become shallow. When Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He said, Jesus doesn't make men rich. 
Jesus' primary objective is not to make you rich. But if you follow Jesus, you can be poor. If you are poor, it's because you choose suffering for the sake of the gospel. Not because there are no principles in scripture to empower you. How can God not bless us and God will be asking us to sponsor his agenda? Is that not tyranny? A God who doesn't bless you is telling you to sponsor global agenda. Where will I get 10 million from to give for crusade? If God does not have a hand in my blessing. When the Bible said that the blessings of God make it rich and added no sorrow. Be careful. There is a spiritual dimension to poverty. There is also a spiritual dimension to prosperity. I'm not saying because of the spiritual dimension, don't apply the universal dimension. I'm saying in addition to the universal dimension, take advantage of the spiritual dimension. And the first way is to accept the blessings of the, of the, of the gospel. The second way is to walk in the covenant. The Bible said in Acts 3.25 that we are children of the covenant. I taught you here that God is not necessarily in covenant with us, but we are offsprings of the covenant. My son will live to do what I do because he's a child of the covenant I have with my wife. Because therein is his blessing. That's why 2 Corinthians 9 from verse 6 to 8, the Bible made it clear that if you give sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you give bountifully, you reap bountifully. He said, every man as he has proposed in his heart, let him give. He said, for God loves a cheerful giver. And he said, God is able. That means God is not able if you don't give. He said, God is able to make all grace abound towards us. That we having all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. So you must practice the covenant. Because it's a battle. And many people don't know that their poverty is not because they are not hardworking. Their poverty is because Satan knows that if they are rich, kingdom will advance. So he crippled their resources. And finally, death. Satan uses death. If he cannot stop you, he wants to kill you. Revelation 2.10, Jesus said they will arrest you, they will imprison you, and they will kill you. Satan wants to kill. So how do you deal with Satan? Number one, cast out devils. Anywhere you see demonic oppression, cast them out. Mark 16, 17, it says, in my name, cast out devils. Most of you don't cast out demons. You think demons are cast out in church. There are more demons in your workplace than in church. There are times when you enter your office, you notice demonic oppressions. You begin to resist them in prayer. Sometimes you go to the office two hours before time. You lock the door and address all of the demons locking around so that they don't have a place. Otherwise, they will manipulate men in that office and bring you down. Cast out demons. Learn it. Jesus casted out devils in the market. He cast out devils everywhere he went to. You must learn how to cast out devils using your authority in the name of Jesus. Number two, wrestle principalities. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If the devil wants to pull you down, tell him he will go down first. And anything God tells you to do, do it with all your life. There are some of you here, God will tell you, pray at night. If you need to shut down six to sleep so that you wake up at night to pray, shut down. Your destiny depends on it. Because if you don't wrestle him down, he will wrestle you down. So learn to wrestle. A weak Christian will be a victim any day, any time. Learn to wrestle. We have pastors wrestling for everybody. So people come to church only for prophetic words. There is an extent prophetic words will take you. There are things that you will fight for yourself. And if you can't fight for yourself, you will see few people testify every week and you'll be wondering when it's my turn. Learn to wrestle. The psalmist said in Psalm 144 verse 1, the Lord teaches my hands to fight and my fingers to war. Number three, avoid sin and sinful life if you want to win over Satan. Because if you allow sin to corrupt you, your faith can't produce result. That's the danger of sin. It may not necessarily, it does, but sometimes it may not even hinder the devil. It will stop your own faith from working. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 1.17, it says, holding faith and a good conscience 
which some having put away concerning faith have shipwrecked their faith. So some people's faith can't work because sin has silenced their faith. Number four, avoid unbiblical practices. Some of you, your problem came when you started baiting with salt. Some of you, your problem started when you started coming outside by 12 midnight naked to pray. The Bible never told us God we answer prayers because we prayed naked. On biblical practices. Do we pray naked? Yes, if you are baiting, you can pray. But the idea of taking off your shirt around 12 midnight for God to hear you, you will meet Sambalat and Toba. <laughs> oh Lord, I'm standing naked. Who told you that nakedness has authority in the courts of heaven? Jesus said, in my name, he gave you what to come in. Come in the name of Jesus, not in your nakedness. I don't know where people learn these things from. And that's why many prophets, false prophets, false apostles have slept with innocent young ladies. They go to the river by 12 midnight to pray. I know warfare can be done at midnight. But all of this, oh, I'm naked. I must bait around 12. Who, where did you learn it from? See, in God's mercy, he can honor your faith. But he said, in the days of ignorance, God overlooks. But now he asks all men to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. There are certain places where people say they get favor when they sleep with men of God. There are, that's an anointed man. Who, there's oil on that light. When you touch him, things will enter you. Barbaric practices that is pushed into the body of Christ by men, creatures of lewdness. Some, they bait them on the altar. They come to the altar. They are baiting them for favor. That you take your bath on the altar of God. Your life can't be the same. And they are, they are drowning in the hands of demons. Don't get involved in unbiblical practices. Listen. Trust what the Bible tells us. And live according to the injunctions of the finished works of Christ. Your life will be victorious. Telling you why many are enslaved. Some people are washing themselves with salt to sanctify themselves so that every reproach on their lives will go salt. When we were washed by the blood of Jesus, that's not enough. It's salt that they need. And because the person who told you wore a long gown with red uh, robe and, and with a big uh, cross and it's jumping, you reach us. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, God oh, you reign, you reign, you reign. hear me. Tonight, my body is to give you instructions to practice. That's why I took my time maintaining my tempo to explain these things. I told you there are manifestations that we can't explain in doctrine expressly, but that does not give us license to practice things that are outside doctrine. You'll be enslaved. Don't allow your desperation make you do things that are not in the Bible. You will become a victim and your deliverance may never happen. Stay within the, the confines of scriptures, what is revealed and what the body of Christ believes in. Your problem is not peculiar to you. Many have gone through that path, they've been delivered. You can't remain there. He sent his word to Jacob, 
he lightened upon Israel. Have you learned something tonight? Have you learned something tonight? Now lift your right hand toward heaven and begin to enforce it in prayer. Let's pray for two minutes. Two minutes. And then I make a simple declaration. Kados, you are mighty on your truth. You reign, you reign, you reign. Maravakata kabaro da bakata. Maregete kevondo robobokoria. You reign, you reign, you reign. Marovara kapete kete kete kete. Rika prakdo zopra kapata tira parakata. You reign, you reign, you reign. I want to pray for one set of people tonight. One set of people. There are people who are going through cycles and patterns of the bloodline. Some of you have noticed a pattern of death. Some of you have noticed a pattern of stagnation. Some of you have noticed a pattern of terminal diseases. And you have been fighting those things, which is right. But now you understand the protocol. That you identify the pattern. You shut the gate. You enforce the finished works and you ask for mercy. How do you shut the gate? You shut the gate through genuine repentance. I want to pray for everybody standing here tonight who has seen patterns, repeated patterns that seem not to go and has been fighting a battle of futility. In the next one minute, I want you to check. Look into your family. Find out that weakness of flesh that Satan has built a throne on that is using to afflict your family. Take time. Pray now. Go back in the spirit and check it. When you find it, we are going to repent. We are going to give room for genuine repentance. And we will break patterns. We will break patterns tonight. Can you go ahead and pray in one minute? Oh, he and I do double and oh, I do double and oh, Baro Pateke Faragapatoa, the get the dead 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 and I do double and oh, I do double and oh, oh, he be the head. Some of you will be shocked how easy it is to stop patterns that has lasted for aeons. You have not known how to shut gates. God told me, drunkenness, lying, pride, immorality. If you shut them out, no prince can afflict you. And it has been so till you date. Now, I want to pray for those who want to end patterns. Some people spoke to me this week. I was so broken with sympathy. From first son, second, third, even to the children, all forms of affliction. Patterns. If you have x-rayed your family and you have seen the weaknesses of flesh that even yourself has made a habit which has become the throne that Satan has and you want to shut that gate tonight. You want to end that pattern forever tonight. 
I want you to come forward. Let's put an end to some cycles forever and ever. Those of you watching online, you can place your hand on your chest. If you will repent genuinely, one declaration, you'll be shocked. Satan is not strong. He just hides himself in mysteries. Patterns. Some is smoking. Some is drunkenness. Some is womanizing. Some is lying. I know you are a Christian. I know Christ died for you. But you have given too much room to Satan. You want to shut that gate? So that certain cycles will stop. Let your prayers not be hindered. Ojo do dabu eno. Oh he mean he hey. And I do dabu eno. Ojo do dabu eno. Oh he mean he hey. Akwata ki gbi ti hi eh. And I do dabu eno. Oh, John, do the boo and all. Oh, John, do the boo and all. Oh, he be the eh. Ah, eh. Ah, 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 Listen, sometimes what you need is not a wristband. It's not to buy the picture of a man of God. That's not what you need. Those who do it, I don't know the revelations they have. I respect their revelation. But I'm telling you, if you leave gates open, Satan will enter and he will exploit it. You want to stop the devil, shut the gate. If you give him a place, don't blame him when he exploits you. Whatever it is, you are repenting from tonight. I know you've given your heart to Christ. You are not here to give your heart to Christ. But after giving your heart to Christ, there is a practice of sin in your bloodline that you are an apostle of, you are an advocate of. That's what you are coming to drop before the altar. And this is not an emotional thing. This is a legalistic thing. Whatever that thing is, you know it. You know it. Right now, as you place your hand on your chest, surrender that iniquity. Lord, call it by name. Forget about who is standing next to you. This is the battle. This is the warfare. This is the warfare. From today, I separate from drunkenness forever. From today, I severe myself from womanizing. From today, I severe myself from lying. From today, I severe myself from pride. From today, I severe myself from malice. From today, I severe myself from bitterness. I drop all of those patterns. Lord, grace, 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 grace to drop this yoke. I've given Satan authority for too long. I've given Satan the advantage for too long. Paul said, less Satan has an advantage over us. We are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Every advantage I have given Satan, I take it back tonight. I take it back tonight. I take it back tonight. Can you pray like someone who is aggressive? He said when he became tired with the yoke, he will break it off his shoulders. You are breaking off a yoke off your shoulder. When you become tired, you will break the yoke. I'm tired of the cycle of death. I'm tired of the cycle of stagnation. 40 years women, 38 years women cannot get married. First class graduates cannot get jobs. I'm tired of the cycle of affliction. Everybody must not be diabetic. Everybody must not be hypertensive. We shut the gates. We shut the gates. We shut the gates. We shut the gates. We gave Satan the authority. Now in repentance and brokenness, we take it back. Makete karato bataya. Zezezeva. 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 
Kito Pakatora, Ragabada Sadadane, Adeliga Pakeria, Barondos Kafrakta, Liga Baruda, Dadina Dadosh, Eriado Dabana, Dadina Daka, Bando, 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 Atetete Rakatoni, Shabarakata, Alelele, Baperoni, Bagabura, Zahela, Mentete, Akeradia, Vauradu Ataya. Pray in the spirit. I'm telling you what we are doing here. He has no respect for title. You can be an apostle yet stagnated for 30 years. You can be a prophet yet afflicted with sickness. You can be a priest. If you don't shut the gate, Satan will make mess of you. Boruata, Ketekato, Bakatoto, Aregeduna, Baragatuash, Zayata, Zayata, Afefepala, Bararuna, Manteke, Abarado, Dagabatua, Jagoto, Datadana, Bararoto, Dagatiata, Elelecado, Baroto, Zekene, Dariado, Baratata, Antetete, Aragaduna, Bambaria, Darotash, 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 Ila Kapatate, Zobabaya. Manto Parete Feketo. Yahela, Pele, Yahela, Yahela, Asine, Mayende, Kakana, Ovevavarana, Ayalate, Banderi, Kapatina, Sekayanda, Burua, Eriando, Mambela, Lule, Ela, Apapapani, Mangali, Gagana, Gandalali, Alalila, Ata, Karato, Skepak, Kepatina, Bantetari, Baragatina, Tagata, Oma, Reterira, Jela. Mande perro do boko bosco parabata. Bante kete. We cross every pattern. We cross every legality. We cross every fleshly tendency. Tonight we provoke emancipation. Zofane parita. Faferakis kabate. Zoso zavina maragadia. Jaka. From the depths of your heart, genuinely, and grace will be supplied to help you pathway with that affliction forever, with that legality forever, with that fleshly tendency forever. No more secrecy, no alcoholism, no womanizing, no lying, no bitterness, no biting, no hatred, no competition. The weaknesses, the weaknesses that give Satan a gate. That gives him a throne in my life. I remove it now. Mamela Monaka, Veruata Davakuta, Zegedota Baragadosh, Shakai. Can we travel? Travel, travel. In the name of Jesus. Now lift your hands toward heaven. Jesus defeated Satan. Satan will be powerful in your life to the degree that you allow him. And the way you allow him is through the tendencies of flesh. Now I'm going to pray three prayers. Number one, the grace to help you that these things you have dropped, you will not be like the swine that goes back to the mud after you have been washed. Paul said, I continue to this day because the Lord helped me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to hear thunderous amen. You must be in agreement. In the name of Jesus. On ground, online. In the name of Jesus. Receive grace. To live above everything you have submitted tonight. You will not go back to alcoholism. You will not go back to womanizing. You will not go back to lying. You will not go back to pride. You will not go back to bitterness, envy and competition. In the name of Jesus. Everything you have dropped on the altar tonight is buried forever 
is buried forever. In the name of Jesus. He said there is an abomination under the sun. Princes are trekking. Beggars are riding on horses. This is the manipulation that makes that possible. When princes behave like servants, they will live like servants. They say, a man in honor that knoweth not. It's like the beast of the field that perishes. Every time we live by the dictates of flesh, we dethrone ourselves. So that Satan can have an advantage. But tonight, that thing lives your life forever. That pornography lives forever. That masturbation lives forever. In the name of Jesus. Number two. He said that the communication of your faith might become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I decree and declare, manifest that righteousness now. He said that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you. I decree and declare, manifest the power of the Holy Ghost now. He said, he that has the son has life. Eternal life is in you. I decree and declare, manifest the provisions of eternal life now. In the name of Jesus. Hear me. Everything Jesus died for you to be, walk into it now. He said, you are a king and a priest. Walk into it now. He said, you are the righteousness of God. Walk into it now. He said, you are anointed of the spirit. Walk into it now. He said, you have the life of God. Walk into it now. In the name of Jesus, manifest. 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 In the name of Jesus. And finally, he said, he who the son of man sets free, he is free indeed. Now we take authority over Satan. He had the right to establish patterns in your family and in your life because of the advantage you gave him. Now it has been removed. And so we decree every demon, every prince, and every witch cooperating with Satan to bring affliction to your families. They are judged now. They are judged now. We write a commandment. Every priest that will not repent and leave your matter in 14 days, they die by fire. If they do not repent in 14 days, they die by fire. He said to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approve it not. Everyone standing against the fulfillment of your destiny if they don't give way they will go down by fire in the name of Jesus now every demon that has been assigned to your, your name or your family that comes at certain cycles and certain seasons six months, one year two years three years, five years, seven years, we decree by the power in the name of Jesus, get out of their lives now. Get out of their lives now. Get out of their lives now. In the name of Jesus. And we decree right now, every principality, every power, every ruler of darkness, every spiritual wickedness that has created a law around your manifestation and that of your family. The Bible said, he who the son of man sets free is free indeed. We decree your liberty from their bondage in the name of Jesus. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run out therein and they are saved. We decree your salvation now in the name of Jesus. Every Egyptian spirit that has kept you in bondage by the blood of the Lamb will break their powers now. 
every Babylonian spirit that have put you in bondage will decree by the testimony of the prophetic their hold is broken now every Assyrian spirit that have put you in bondage we decree by the power of priesthood their bondage breaks now go and prosper in the name of Jesus I replace stagnation with speed I replace death with life I replace sickness with health I replace shame with glory I replace poverty with prosperity I replace cause with blessings go forward and prosper go forward and prosper go forward and prosper in the name of Jesus Somebody give the Lord a show. Hear this. As you return, that affliction ends forever. Go and write it down. I have entered my victory. As you return, only testimonies are permitted to abound in your life. Wherever you have fallen before, you will stand there to rejoice in the name of Jesus. He said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, he said, we were like them that dream dreams. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. I prophesy over you. Your life shall be filled with laughter. Your mouth shall be filled with laughter. And from this night, begin to have miracles. Those who are sick with terminal infirmities, they are healed. Those who are in bondage by demons, they are healed. Those who are frustrated by manipulations of hell, they are liberated. This is your emancipation ceremony. Somebody show! Sabaoth, Yahweh, Sabaoth, Yahweh, Sabaoth, Yahweh, Sabaoth. Yahweh Yahweh That's your way to your seat that you celebrate On ground online Congratulations Hold on The King of Glory, Yahweh Sabaoth, Yahweh Sabaoth, Oh Lord, He's the King of the King of Glory, Yahweh Sabaoth, Yahweh Sabaoth, He's the King of Glory, the King of Glory. Give the Lord the show. Now hear this. Walk in the consciousness of victory from now. Don't go back saying, oh, this thing happening in our family. It has been changed. Go with a new consciousness. And hear me. When God does anyone, write it down and celebrate. When he does another one, Write it down and celebrate. The same way you recorded your woes, now you will record your blessings. Somebody give the Lord a show! Thank you, Father. This is the wisdom that governs the judgments of God. And it's on the premise of this wisdom that true emancipation is granted to the people of God. Congratulations. Tonight is your night. And whatever the Lord doeth, the Bible said it shall abide forever. Give the Lord a big hand clap as you take your seat.
So we have come to the end of the series. I had to stretch to finish it. But trust me, you didn't hear what you thought you heard. Go back, listen to the message. And you will discover many things that you should learn and apply. And the Lord will bless you and make you a blessing to others. Those of you who are watching online, listen again. Share it. Let many people get to hear it. Publish the word of God. Learn to publish the word of God. Don't just hear it and be blessed. Put it on your platform. Let somebody hear and be blessed. And God will continue to multiply.